today i will be taking class on pneumoconiosis and lead poisoning i am dr swapna joswan associate professor department of community medicine raja rajeshwari medical college and hospital so i would be taking this class if anybody has any doubt please write down those doubts and i'll give you at the end the some time so that you can ask your queries fine so have you all heard about the word pneumoconiosis maybe you would have heard about lead poisoning pneumoconiosis you may or may not have heard okay so what are the objective of this session the objective of this session is at the end of the class you must be able to describe what is pneumoconiosis must be able to list the common type of pneumoconiosis also the common clinical features of pneumoconiosis the prevention and control measures for pneumoconiosis various sources of lead poisoning sonu can you please mute your microphone can you phone panni irudhe na na vandrala saundarya please mute your microphone yes followed by diagnosis and treatment in lead poisoning and what are the preventive and control of lead poisoning so these are the objective of this class so coming to history of pneumoconiosis it is likely that humans have suffered from occupational lung disease once the humans have changed their occupation from hunting to agriculture and to industrialization that is when the occupational lung disease have come into existence the first recorded mention of breathlessness among the handlers of grain was seen among the by the father of occupational health that is ramzani in 1713 so as early as 1713 itself they identify that the occupation was one of the cause for pneumoconiosis continuing with the history in the 18th and the early 19th century it was thought that the symptoms of black lung disease was asthma related so when they used to do post mortem and they used to find black lung then they used to think that all those cases were related to asthma alone then following which they coined the black lung when the medical professionals started discovering the black, uh, blackening of the miner's lung in the post mortem the first documented case of asbestos related death was reported in 1906 when the autopsy of an uh, asbestos workers was found to have a black lung so now what does pneumoconiosis mean the term pneumoconiosis is derived from a greek word where pneuma means air konios means dust so it is a disease by inhalation of dust in the air that's what pneumoconiosis mean pneumoconiosis are a group of lung disease occurring out of specific occupation when a person is exposed to a specific occupation and it is caused due to inhalation of insoluble dust over a prolonged period of exposure so today one person get exposed to a dust he will get pneumoconiosis no so it needs to be specific occupation and it should be inhalation of a insoluble dust and it should be over a prolonged period of exposure only then pneumoconiosis occurs there is no treatment for pneumoconiosis the only thing for pneumoconiosis is prevention so prevention is the only intervention for pneumoconiosis so you should have this in mind now coming to the factors and influence of pneumoconiosis so pneumoconiosis as i told you it is due to inhalation of air which full of dust that dust might be due to different types that i will be explaining later on but what is the factor which influences pneumoconiosis these are the concentration of dust in hair 
if the concentration of dust in air is higher then greater is the health hazard the permissible limit is around 200 microgram per cubic meter of air so the higher the concentration of dust the greater is the chance of pneumoconiosis over a period of time next is the composition of dust so if the dust contains insoluble particles and if it is a complicated it's a complex particle then greater is the health hazard if it is a soluble one the hazard is less coming to the size of the dust particles the size of the dust particles also very important in pneumoconiosis if the size is around 0.5 to 3 microns the risk of pneumoconiosis is high the reason being that it enters the alveoli if it is 0.5 micron to 3 micron if it is greater than that if it is more than 3 micron it is somewhere in the mid respiratory passage and if it is 5 to 10 it is in the upper respiratory passage it gets caught there so the size of the dust particles very important duration of exposure as i told you pneumoconiosis is a very long duration condition it doesn't occur over a period of days or months it occurs over a period of years minimum of 10 to 15 years is required for the occurrence of pneumoconiosis when a person is continuously exposed for a particular dust and for a long duration of size and the size particle being very small and also the individual susceptibility also is very important in getting pneumoconiosis if a person is having better health nutritional status then the chances of development of pneumoconiosis is very less fine so what are the different types of common pneumoconiosis which is found so the types of dust and the diseases caused the table is given here the so if it is a coal dust it is inhalation of coal dust causes anthracosis and uh, if it is silica inhalation of silica causes silicosis and inhalation of asbestos dust causes asbestosis inhalation of iron dust causes siderosis so this is the organic dust coming to this is inorganic dust coming to organic dust classification sugarcane fiber inhalation under over a long period of time causes bagososis cotton dust inhalation causes bisinosis and tobacco inhalation dust inhalation causes tobaccosis hay or a grain dust inhalation causes farmers lung now let's talk about silicosis silicosis is one of the form of pneumoconiosis it develops with repeated and usually long term exposure to silica dust particularly the crystalline silica when a person is continuously exposed to silica dust over a period of years around 5 to 10 years then there is chance of getting silicosis the silica dust once when inhaled causes irritation and inflammation of the airways in the lung tissue and this causes uh, once the inflammation heals scar tissue is formed which results in fibrosis that gradually overtakes a healthy lung tissue and hence the fibrosis sets in the fibrosis extends through the lungs even after the exposure ends so even after if a person is working for around 8 to 10 years in uh, uh, in a silica industry and then he stops exposing himself or after period of 8 years or so it doesn't mean that it will stop it, the inflammation and the fibrosis continues and it continue it never halts so prevention is the only mode of stopping as i told you before the size of the dust matters a lot so if it is in the range of 5 micron to 10 micron the dust settle down in the upper respiratory tract and if the size of the dust is between 3 to 5 micron it settles in the mid respiratory tract and if it is somewhere between 1 to 3 microns only then it enters the alveoli so the size of the dust is very important then what happens in the pathogenesis so once the silica particle particles enters the alveoli there are macrophages so the macrophages disintegrates and the silica it reacts with silica and there is chemical reaction and there is fibroblast formation and this continues to happen and then a scar tissue is formed and the fibrosis continues to occur this is how the pathogenesis of silicosis occurs 
So what are the clinical features? The clinical features for pneumoconiosis remains the same in all the cases, whether it is silicosis, whether it is asbestosis, whether it is anthracosis. So on prolonged exposure, gradually a person suffering from pneumoconiosis or silicosis gets chronic cough and it is associated with or without hemoptysis. There is dyspnea, difficulty in breathing that worsen with exertion. There is also fatigue, loss of appetite, loss of weight. There is a condition called silicotuberculosis that pulmonary tuberculosis can occur in patient who is having silicosis. It is seen that 25% of the patient uh, can have silicotuberculosis. And, uh, but they are not being able to isolate the tubercle bacilli in such cases. Whether the silicosis um, Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. You want me to repeat the X-ray uh, features in silicosis or did you all understand? You want me to repeat the X-ray finding in silicosis or was that audible? Okay, so I will continue with it. So what are the occupations with exposure of, okay, okay, I'll repeat that for Indu. So this is an x-ray showing the features of silicosis. As I told you, initially we will see the reticulation of lung field. Followed by that, there is nodule formation. And these nodules uh, collage to form the snowstorm appearance. So that is one of the pathognomic feature of the silicosis in the X-ray view. So what are the various occupations which is associated with exposure to silica dust? It includes mining, quarrying, sandblasting, ceramic industries, brick making, slate and pencil industry also use silica in various proportion. Next, we will be talking about anthracosis. Anthracosis is also called as coal workers pneumoconiosis. This is mainly due to inhalation of coal dust over a long period of time. It is called as coal workers pneumoconiosis or minors black lung. So this is what is anthracosis. So it is mainly due to inhalation of coal dust. Um, the coal dust accumulates in the bronchioles and the alveoli. There are two phases in anthracosis. The first phase is simple pneumoconiosis. The second phase is progressive massive fibrosis. So the first phase, simple pneumoconiosis, it is in this, there is little ventilatory impairment. This takes around 10 to 12 years of exposure for the development of simple pneumoconiosis. There is atrophy of the bronchial smooth muscles and there is focal emphysema in case of simple pneumoconiosis. Whereas in case of progressive massive fibrosis, this follows the simple pneumoconiosis and this leads to pulmonary hypertension 
and corpulmonal here there is severe respiratory distress and followed by which there will be congestive cardiac failure and there might be premature death when there is progressive massive fibrosis once persons ends up with simple pneumoconiosis he will end up with progressive massive uh, fibrosis even following stoppage of exposure to coal dust so it is a continuous process this doesn't stop so what are the predisposing factors in anthracosis it includes smoking tuberculosis and autoimmunity so if as i told you before if a person healthy i mean nutritional and health status is very important if a person is smoking and having tuberculosis and his immunity status is low and he is working in a coal dust mine then the chances of getting the pneumoconiosis is high compared to the one who is healthy and doesn't have a habit of smoking and other things in chest x ray there is multiple nodular density or reticulation is seen it sees as a black lung in case of anthracosis i am not repeating the clinical features for each and everything because the clinical features remains the same there is no difference in the clinical features every uh, uh, pneumoconiosis presents with cough with or without hematosis weight loss loss of appetite and chest pain and so on and so forth so i'm just describing each and every pneumoconiosis the importance part of it so next we go to asbestosis asbestosis is mainly due to inhalation of asbestos dust so asbestos is a commercial name given to fibrous mineral silicate it is a silica combined with oxygen and other elements like calcium magnesium iron sodium or aluminium so there are mainly of two types um asbestos one is the serpentine and the other one is amphibole type the serpentine type is the white asbestos and the amphibole type is the one which is more um carcinogenic uh, and the blue one is the amphibole type whereas the white asbestos is a serpentine type so asbestosis occurs in those people who work in the um asbestos cement sheet making or pipe making so asbestos is also an insoluble dust which results in fibrosis and the classical features of asbestosis in an x ray is a ground glass appearance and uh, other than fibrosis it can lead to pleural calcification and also it may result in neoplasm it can be a bronchogenic carcinoma or it may lead to malignant mesothelioma next is bisinosis bisinosis is mainly due to inhalation of cotton dust so when cotton dust is inhaled over a long period of time those workers who work mainly in the textile industries are exposed uh, to the cotton dust and end up with bisinosis so they also present with cough and dyspnea and uh, they present with symptoms of chronic bronchitis and emphysema next is bagasosis bagasosis is due to inhalation of cane sugar dust so cane sugar was initially not utilized it was thrown off but now the even the remains of the cane sugar is utilized in the manufacture of paper cardboard and rayon so it is not only seen in people working in sugar factories but also seen in were people working in paper cardboard and rayon factories so after the extraction of juice from the cane sugar the remaining is called bagasse then that is left for a long time in the presence of moisture and heat it um, allows the development of a fungi called thermo actinomyces sacchari so there is development of this fungi and this when inhaled over a long period of time result in bagasosis so the clinical feature is same as in other pneumoconiosis but x ray feature shows the mottling appearance in the lung field in case of bagasosis and uh, the only thing we can do so bagasosis is prevent the exposure to cane sugar dust the next one is farmer's lung 
it is a chronic disease of the lung it is due to inhalation of moldy hay or grain dust in the agriculture field so this is mostly caused seen among the farmers so during the winter season what happens is the grain dust will have moisture content which is high around 30% plus and the bacteria grow rapidly and they produce heat so this encourage the growth of a fungi thermophilic fungi caused called as micro polyspora and this when inhaled for a long period of time will leads to hypersensitivity reaction in the lungs and development of antibodies uh, they are present also with allergic bronchitis and repeated attacks lead to fibrosis and lung damage causing corp pulmonary x ray features in case of farmers lung you may see fine nodular density as i told you there is no treatment for pneumoconiosis the only thing we can do for pneumoconiosis is prevention and control now how do you do prevention and control we know that various levels of prevention that is a primary secondary and tertiary level of prevention under that what do we have we have health promotion specific protection early diagnosis treatment and uh, disability limitation and rehabilitation so under each thing i would be telling you what can be done so in health, case of health promotion we need to do pre placement examination so pre placement examination is nothing but we will be examining an individual before he takes up the job whether the person is fit for the job or not will be looking in the pre placement examination uh, for example a person is if he is having color blindness he might not be taking uh, taken for a driver for um, railway engine or if he is having hernia he will not be taken up for li lifting heavy objects so this is called as ergonomics which will be discussed in the uh, further uh, occupational uh, diseases classes so that is how pre placement examination is done so giving the right job to the right person if he is not uh, fit for the job then the job won't be given to him then health education should be involved so regularly the employees must be educated about the risk and the hazards of inhaling this dust over a long period of time and they should also be told not to smoke and hence to prevent these hazards the um, environment in which they are working should also be a healthy one so healthy physical environment is a must in people working in those dust producing environment um, so cleanliness adequate ventilation good housekeeping wet mopping of the floors are all mandatory in these industries so that the dust is reduced to a minimum level and control of dust how to control the dust so if there is an area which produce a lot of dust so we have to um see to it that the dust should be minimized to a lowest level so preventing the escape of the dust into the atmosphere or he, uh, having the exhaust ventilation or uh, repeatedly mopping and uh, using wet method that is water sprays are used at the place where the dust is produced more so that the dust is not escapes to a further distance so these are the various method under health promotion now under specific protection what is it so you know that specific protection is using a uh, protection to for that particular thing if they are exposed to the dust then wearing of face mask wearing of goggles and if they are exposed to dyes then they have to wear the boots they have to wear gloves these are the various methods where they can protect themselves so this is coming under specific protection early diagnosis and treatment so how do we diagnose early this condition so there is something called periodic medical examination the workers will be examined periodically monthly or once in 3 months or once in 6 months so that there they can be detected at the early and if there is and uh, problem in them in in terms of x ray or the blood readings then they might be changed from what they are doing they might be changed and the exposure can be minimized to at the earliest 
disability limitation is uh, limiting the further disability of the worker by detecting the slightest degree of disability and immediately giving him an other suitable job where he is not exposed to the same condition rehabilitation becomes very important in those workers who have already become handicapped and who have already developed fibrosis of the lungs they require physical psychological social and vocational rehabilitation so now we have finished uh, pneumoconiosis is there any questions for pneumoconiosis from the students so shall i continue with lead poisoning if you don't have any questions on pneumoconiosis are you all there am i audible am i audible can you hear me okay fine i will be continuing the class is there any doubts in pneumoconiosis okay fine so let me start with lead poisoning lead poisoning is also called as plumbism plumbin is a latin word for lead so lead is present everywhere wherever you are there lead is present everywhere and it is widely used it is widely used because of the properties that is it has a low boiling point it can mix easily with other metals to form alloys it can be oxidized easily and it is an anti corrosive metal so hence lead is used widely and the toxic compounds of lead include lead arsenate lead carbonate and lead oxide lead sulfide is the least toxic among the lead particles so what are the various sources of lead so the sources of lead could be occupational and non occupational sources of lead now let's see the occupational source of lead the occupational source of lead include the mines of the lead ores the industries of the glass paint and storage batteries pin printing and pottery is also use lead and the plumbing work that is a pipe pipe fitting job that also uh, involves a lot of exposure to lead these are the occupational source of lead coming to non occupational source of lead the greatest source is the leaded petrol it is a heavy metal and it doesn't burn and it comes out as solid form and thousands tons of lead is exhausted from automobiles every year this lead to environmental lead poisoning and uh, the other uh, non occupational type of lead poisoning is by drinking water conveyed through the lead pipes and by drinking uh, these uh, mainly through the lead pipes which is corroded and also by eating fruits sprayed with in insecticides containing lead and in children it can occur because they have a pica uh to eat this uh, lead paint by nibbling of toys which is coated with lead and uh, they also some have habit of eating the lead pencils uh so the main form through which the lead um is absorbed is through inhalation and through ingestion coming to the body stores of lead so the body stores the normally the body stores is around 150 to 400 mg the blood level of lead is around 25 micrograms per 100 ml when the blood levels of lead increases to around 70 micrograms per 100 ml that is when the person presents with clinical signs and symptoms till then he won't be present with any signs and symptoms usually the adult ingests around 0.2 to 0.3 mg of lead every day and above, i mean among the lead which is um, absorbed so 90% is excreted in the feces and only 10% is absorbed and 10% is going through goes through the kidney and excreted through urine and the rest of it is stored majority in the bones and some part in the liver and in the kidney so if you have to talk about clinical features whatever you have read in medicine about all the signs and symptoms it goes well with 
um, lead poisoning. So lead poisoning did present, it involves all the system. So inorganic lead poisoning and organic lead poisoning. Uh, it is like inorganic lead poisoning is mainly the involvement of the alimentary system. It uh, can affect almost every system of the body. It doesn't spare any system. And organic lead poisoning, it is the involvement of the central nervous system. So when inorganic lead poisoning occurs, it's mainly the alimentary system which is involved. When organic lead poisoning, it is mainly the central nervous system involved. So when it is central nervous system involvement, it is characterized by insomnia, headache, mental confusion, irritability, nervousness, anxiety, convulsion, delirium, coma and death. And in case of inorganic lead poisoning, it could be anemia or the blue line on the gums, which is also known as Burton's line. It is due to the deposition of the lead sulfide granules in the gums. Uh, it can cause colicky abdomen, diarrhea, encephalopathy, fatigue, giddiness, so on and so forth. So every system in the body is involved in case of lead poisoning. So how do you diagnose a case of lead poisoning? It's mainly a detailed history should be taken about an exposure, whether it is an occupational exposure, if he's a plumber or uh, is he working in any of the sources, as I told you, any of the mines which uses lead as a most common um, ingredients. And then uh, it could, various other history will let you know whether the person is exposed occupationally to lead or not. And if it's a child, these, uh, does the child have a pica and uh, constantly eating the lead uh, pencils and things like that can give you a diagnosis. And the clinical features, as I told you, just enumerated just to the previous slide, it could be anything. All the systems are involved in case of lead poisoning. And in case of lab finding, what is that you got to look in lab finding? It is a CPU, that is a corpoporphyrin in urine is this one of the best screening tests to know whether a person is having lead poisoning or not. Usually it is less than 150 microgram per liter. If it is more than that, then you suspect lead poisoning. And uh, next is ALAU is amino levulinic acid in urine. If it is uh, more than five milligram per liter, then you consider that the person is having lead poisoning and also measurement of lead in blood. As I told you, the normal level is around 25 microgram, but if it is more than 70 microgram per 100 ml and press in the urine, if it is more than 0.8 milligram, then you consider to be having poisoning. And when a peripheral smear is done, there is also basophilic stippling of the RBCs observed. This is also one of the features to think lead poisoning as a cause for basophilic stippling. Now, what are the preventive measures? Now the preventive measures, as I told you in pneumoconiosis is the same thing holds good even for lead poisoning. So the health promotion, specific protection, early diagnosis, treatment, disability limitation, as well as rehabilitation. Uh, so in health promotion is pre-placement examination, same. First you look into the details of the person's health status and see whether a person is fit for the job or not and a detailed health education must be given regarding what needs to be done, how to prevent exposure to lead and how to wear the various uh, personal protective equipments and provision of a healthy physical environment should be clean and uh, should be healthy and the control of dust as I told you before should be done so that the dust is not widespread and it is inhaled or ingested and you can do substitution. That is use of unleaded petrol instead of leaded petrol is one of the greatest uh, preventive measures for exposure of lead. So use the unleaded petrol instead of the lead paints can be substituted by unleaded paints and so on and so forth. Now, uh, continuing with the preventive measures, as I told you specific protection using of personal protective equipment Accordingly, wearing the mask, wearing the goggles, wearing the gloves, wearing the boots and wearing a separate um, I mean, gown when they are working in that uh, 
occupation and then they have to remove that when they come into the other places and that needs to be washed regularly those things should be taken care of early diagnosis and treatment uh, periodic examination needs to be done and the blood levels of lead and urine must be seen and uh, treatment if there is lead poisoning patient can be treated with calcium edta and d penicillamine and disability limitation if uh, if there is uh, the early onset of disability then the person must be given another suitable job and rehabilitation if is already into um, lead poisoning then the person must be rehabilitated adequately now so to summarize pneumoconiosis and lead poisoning pneumoconiosis are a group of lung diseases which occurs out of specific occupation as i told you if it is silica for a long period of time it is silicosis asbestosis anthracosis so it is due to a specific occupation and caused by inhalation of insoluble dust so when the dust is soluble it doesn't create all this problem when it is insoluble it reacts with the macrophages causing fibrosis and uh, uh, the pathology in the lung it, it is mainly due to insoluble dust and of exposure so it doesn't occur over a period of uh, weeks or months together it needs to be 10 to 15 years of exposure for one to get pneumoconiosis as i told you there is no treatment prevention is the only intervention in case of pneumoconiosis and uh, about lead poisoning lead is the most commonly used everywhere because of its property and the source is occupational and non occupational source so prevention is plays an important role in both pneumoconiosis and lead poisoning that includes the health promotion specific protection early diagnosis treatment disability limitation and rehabilitation so in the subsequent class we would be talking the importance of pre placement examination and various engineering methods to control the dust at the point of origin itself so when done this can be limited to a wider extent so these this is the summary so any questions from uh, your side is most welcome so any questions please uh, write it in the chat box any questions in pneumoconiosis or lead poisoning students are you all there okay thank you for the class if you have any doubts i would be waiting for another 5 minutes for you all to ask questions so i don't think anyone's got a doubt so i end the session of pneumoconiosis and lead poisoning so somebody is asking the amino lebelinic acid in urine so it is a normal content of the uh, it is the how much is there so al au is present in the urine which is less than 5 mg per liter so when it is in larger quantities then you can it is like uh, dangerous level is when it is 60 mg per liter and more 
so when that is a condition then you can directly think that lead is the cause for the current condition yes edta is a chelating agent correct why porphyria 